morning, everybody. Hope you're having a good morning this morning. And once again, we find ourselves meeting uh, apart, but together. Um, hopefully, this pandemic, as they call it, is uh, will be coming to an end really soon. I really look forward to the day that we can get back together and and worship in the in the church building together. I am thankful that we have an opportunity and have a way to continue to worship God and uh, and to stay in contact with one another. And I really hope that you're you're doing that together, that you're staying in contact with other church members, families, and friends. You if you'd bow with me. Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we gather together in our respective homes today, and yet we gather together as one. Your holy word tells us that we are, we are the church, and that Jesus is the head of that church. This morning, I pray that you would bid this country of this virus that's in this nation and in this world. We ask for mercy and healing our land. Father, we pray for our leaders, the doctors, the nurses, and all that are out there daily in this battle. We pray for their safety. We pray that you'll guide them in the search for a cure. We know all things are possible through you. Lord, I pray for the service today. May your word touch the saved and the unsaved. And if there's anyone that has never trusted you as Savior, that they would soften their hearts, and this morning would be the morning that they would open their eyes to Jesus. Jesus, our only hope for salvation. It's in the sweet name of Jesus I pray. Amen. You know, before I get started too far this morning, I want to give credit where credit's due. I saw you too video this week posted on our church uh, page. It originated from a man that I didn't know. It was posted by one of the ladies from the church. One fantastic video. The man's name is John Maynard. And so I wanted to shout out to John Maynard. He may never see this, but I wanted to give him credit for the great illustration that I want to share with you this morning. Take a baseball, for instance. In my hands, that baseball is worth about 15 bucks. In the hands of New York Yankees pitcher uh, Garrett Cole, it's worth $36 million a year. It depends on whose hand it's in. You take a a football. In my hands, an NFL football is worth about $85. And in the hands of Patrick Mahomes, local boy, might say, White House, it's going to be worth about $40 million a year. It depends on whose hands that football is in. Now you take a golf club. In my hands, a golf club is worth about $100. In the hands of Tiger Woods, it has a net worth of about $800 million. You see, it depends on whose hand it's in. I'm a hockey fan. I may be the only one you know. But you take a hockey stick. In my hands, it's worth about $185. In the hands of the great one, Wayne Gretzky, it's worth about $250 million. You see, it depends on whose hand it's in. You take a Major League Baseball bat. As you know, Major League Baseball bats are wood. Back in my day, that's all we had was wood. But in my hands, that Major League Baseball bat's worth about $140. In the hands of Mike Trout, it's worth about $37 million a year. You see, it depends on which hands it's in. 
you take a regulation NBA basketball. In my hands, it's worth about $100. In the hands of Michael Jordan, it has a net worth of $2.8 billion, with a B, dollars. You see, it depends on whose hands it was in. Friends, I love these illustrations, and I thank Mr. Maynard and to uh, the lady that posted on the church page the other day. Not only do I enjoy sports, but the concept of whose hands you're in is perfect. I read somewhere that the components of the human body, now we're not telling, talking about selling livers and whatever. We're talking about the everything that makes us up, makes this old temple, this old body, Everything, all the elements that make it up is worth about $6. Think about that. But in the hands of God, they're invaluable. They are priceless. Because we have a choice. We can place our worthless selves in the hands of God, or we can continue to lead a meaningless life. You see, God uses imperfect people that's really a good thing since he's the only perfect person that's ever walked this earth i looked up a list i've seen it before i found it again this week it, it's it's a it's a long list we won't use near all of it today but it it's talking about the imperfect people that god used throughout history. In Genesis, we find that Noah got drunk. Now, I don't know if this is something Noah did regularly, but it sure was. It happened in this instant because the Bible mentions it. Genesis 9.20, it says, Noah, a man of the soil, as we call that a farmer, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of the wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. So Noah got drunk and passed out, what he did. And one of his sons came in and, and found him drunk and naked. And instead of covering him up, he went and told his two brothers. And they come in and covered their dad up. This would lead to consequences to the young son that first discovered him. We'll go into that at some other time. The whole point is, is Noah wasn't a perfect man. But in the hands of God, he was. Then there was Abraham. God told him that he would have a son. A special son. Genesis 17 and 15. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name shall be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nation. The kings of peoples will come from her. Watch this now. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? So here's Abraham. He believed God. He loved God. He was a godly man. But he thought that he was too old to father a child and thought that he was too old to do God's will. He might have been in his mind. But in the hands of God, we are never too old to be out of his service and to do his will. Then there was Joseph. Joseph found out early in life that it was a, a very treacherous time in being the favorite son and the youngest. Now, I had two younger siblings. I have two younger siblings. And uh, I'll have to admit that I'm not real proud of it, but I've made it pretty treacherous on them at times. Uh, 
got him in a lot of trouble. Didn't get him really hurt too bad, but once. Another long story that, uh, well, I'll just tell you real quick. Dad told we were going to go fishing, the three of us. And I was the only one that could drive at the time. Dad told us, now the old brakes on that old truck's not, farm truck's not very good, so park up the top of the hill, don't go down toward the water. Well, I remembered that about 15 seconds, I guess. Start down the hill. You guessed it. Stepped on the brakes and nothing. So in my mind, I did some quick thinking. My quick thinking was this. Do I put this truck and us three in the, in the lake? Or do I pick the tree? Looking back on it, the water might not have been a bad idea. But I squared the license plate and the headlights were looking at each other. Uh, they both got bunged up a little bit. Uh, I wasn't hurt at the time. Uh, I did get bunged up a little later on in the day. But anyway, Joseph found out early how it was to, to, to be the youngest and the favorite. In Genesis 37 and 3, it says, Now Israel, that was the dad, loved Joseph more than any of his brothers because he had been born to him in his old age and he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, the dream that Joseph told his brothers that day was this, that they would bow down to him one day. This would come true. It wouldn't come true right away, but it would come true. But not before his brothers abused him and threw him down a well and finally traded him off and then told the dad that the, that the animals had eaten him up. Anyway, he wound up being a slave in Egypt. And the abuse didn't end there either. He was falsely accused of several different things. He was thrown in prison for two years. And after a couple of years, it just so happened that he had interpreted a dream or two of people that were servants or had been servants of Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a dream. None of his wizards, that's what you want to call them, could interpret what it meant. He was told that there's a guy in jail down there named Joseph that could. So he sent for Joseph. And Joseph did exactly that. He interpreted the dream. Joseph was always faithful to God. Always. And after he interpreted the dreams, Pharaoh let him out. And he became a close, trusted friend of Pharaoh. He was so trusted that he was finally elevated to the second highest official in the land, only under Pharaoh. Number one under Pharaoh. Now Joseph was nothing more than a baby brother who his brothers hated. All this hatred, all this abuse might have made him bitter and angry. But it didn't. In the hands of the Lord, he became a mighty servant of God. You see, it all depended on whose hands he chose to be in. Next is Moses. God chose Moses to lead his people out of bondage, out of slavery, and take them out of Egypt. Moses had a handicap. Evidently, he was a stutterer. He told God that he needed to send someone else due to this handicap he had. God just provided him an interpreter. You see, Moses considered his handicap a stumbling block. And it might have been. In normal life, 
but in the hands of God, he became a great leader. Friends, never let a physical handicap hold you back because it all depends on whose hands you decide to be in. Gideon was afraid, yet God used him for his service. It all depended on whose hand he was in. Samson was a womanizer. God would use him as a great warrior. He had great strength, but he often abused that strength. And his sinful behaviors finally caught up with him. When Delilah convinced him to cut off his hair. God had told him not to do so, but he disobeyed. And he suddenly found that all of his strength was gone. He was arrested, thrown in jail. He was publicly mocked. And as he stood chained between two giant pillars, he was grieved at his sinful behavior toward God. He asked God to return his strength just long enough to destroy the crowd of Philistines that had gathered. God allowed it, and Samson pulled the beams down. In doing so, it killed himself, but he took many of God's enemies with him. Samson's strength was no good alone, but it all depended on who he decided to put his hands in. Next we have Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. That's how she made a living. Now Joshua sent two, two men as spies. He wanted to see what size the army was that was guarding Jericho. These spies hid in Rahab's house, which was inside the walls of the city. Men were sent to find these spies. I guess word had got back to them that there was two of them there. But anyway, they went looking for him. They, they came to Rahab's house and told her, said, bring them out. Well, instead of doing that, she covered them up. The Bible calls it, she covered them up on the roof and the Bible calls it flax. I assume that was some kind of uh, material uh, we would call shingles today. This act in itself would protect her family when Jericho was conquered. Now, her checkered past might have caused the world to think that she was worth very little. But in the hands of God, she played a tremendous part in God's people defeating the enemy at Jericho. Next is Timothy. Timothy was considered too young to preach the gospel. The Apostle Paul encouraged him and told him this in 1 Timothy 4.12. said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. You know, I can remember being a teen. Yes, it's been a few years ago, a bunch of years ago. But I can remember it, and it probably happens to some of you younger folks now. But as a teen, we can feel intimidated talking with older folks, especially if we have a point that we want to make. Be like Timothy. He could have believed that he was worthless because of his young age. But it all depended on whose hands he put himself in. Young people, I encourage you today, do the same as Timothy did. David was an adulterer and a murderer. David repented and God used him for his service and made him king. In his prior condition, David was worthless. But it all depended whose hands he decided to put himself in. Just recently, we talked about Jonah a little bit. One of my great stories in the Bible, I love it. No, Jonah ran from God. But after a few days in the belly of that whale, 
he decided that running wasn't such a good thing. And he decided to put himself in the hands of God. Job. Job lost everything he had. He could have given up. He could have been worthless. But it depended on whose hands he stayed in. And he placed himself and stayed in the hands of God. Then we have Peter. Peter denied Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. Peter could have gone back to just being a fisherman. It all depended on whose hands he was in. He chose to be in the hands of God. Martha was a warrior. The Samaritan woman had been divorced many times. Zacchaeus was considered too small. The Apostle Paul when he was Saul, was too religious. He was a stickler for the law of Moses. At that point, he was pretty worthless until he found himself in the hands of God. Moses took a stick, just a walking stick. They call it a staff. It had little or no monetary value. But through God, through God's hand, through Moses, he parted the sea with it. David took a worthless, monetarily worthless, homemade slingshot and used it to slay the enemy the giant Goliath. Jesus took a small amount of fish, probably not even enough fish to feed me. And he fed 5,000 and had plenty left over. Friends, the entire message today is directed at me and at you. We are all defected. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Alone, we are worthless. But it all depends on whose hands we put ourselves in. I'm not a carpenter. Not even close to being one. I won't call out any names, but there are several of you out there that know that for a fact. Oh, y'all that when we're doing projects, send me after coats or send me after nails or always sending me after something. I caught on to you. You're trying to get me out of here. I get it. I keep going and getting you stuff. Y'all do the building. But, you know, I can take a handful of nails and I build something. Rest assured, it won't be pretty and it won't be square. Not even close. But in the hands of Jesus, those nails that were driven into his hands and into his feet brought salvation to all who will call upon his name. You see, it all depended on the hands they were in. If you would, you bow with me. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to study your word. What a blessing that you gave us this Bible, your holy word for guidance, out of love for us, and that we might understand the greatest gift of all, the gift, the gift of salvation through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray that we will come to the realization that your grace is all we need. That your power works best in our weakness. I pray that we will place whatever gift you have given us in your hands to do service for you. 
Our Lord, it's not about our abilities. It's about our availability. Father, we thank you for the grace, the mercy, and the abundance of love that you place upon your children. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Friends, it's so great to be here with you today. I'm so looking forward to getting back together where we can be as a physical group. I love all of you. Saying I miss you doesn't do it justice. You're my brothers, you're my sisters, you're my friends, you're my church family. I look forward to seeing you again, talking to you again, worshiping the Lord together again. Y'all have a good week. Be good to each other. And may God bless.